Calcium Imaging and Fiber Photometry. This is my study of the Psi-354 course from Macquarie University about clinical neuroscience. To begin with, there are immediate early genes, or IEGs. These genes rapidly but temporarily respond to neural activity uh, due to action potentials. CFOS is one type of IEG, and it is commonly used as a proxy of neuronal activation. In 90 minutes after drug injection, animals are euthanized and dissected and antibodies are added. Through this, for example, we can see the effects of cocaine that has been induced on CFOS, uh, expression activity in the D1 and D2 receptors in the nucleus accumbens. D1 and D2 are dopamine receptors. CFOS, however, only has cellular specificity. Another concept that is very important is electrophysiology. Electrophysiology is to do with implanted electrodes in the brain, and that records electrical activation during behavioral events. Calcium imaging. This interrogates the brain function through translational modes of psychological dysfunction. It relies on genetics, light physics, and neurochemistry to enable real-time measurement of of targeted cells and their projections during meaningful behaviors. Fluorescent molecules, these look at differences in excitation and the emission wavelength. Fluorescence are molecules that absorb photons of one wavelength and emits photons of different wavelengths. Black light is the shining of invisible light, which is about 365 nanometers uh, wavelength, on phosphorine paint to emit back a visible color, that is a wavelength between 500 to 600 nanometers. Through this, you could look at a uh, green fluorescent protein, or GFE, which is derived from jellyfish and excited by 470 75 nanometers, emitting a light of 510 nanometers. Red fluorescent protein, or RFE, is uh, derived from discosoma coral, and it is excited by 560 nanometers, but emits 600 nanometers. Uh, that would be red. Calcium transients. These are temporary passages of calcium through neurons associated with action potentials. It can be used for imaging and fiber photometry. GCAM. They are proteins that cause intracellular calcium to bind to green fluorescent proteins, as well as calmodulin CAM and myosin 13 peptide, or P. Viruses are used to deliver GCAM and it survives for 24 hours before being killed by the immune system. Through these, we can use fiber photometry, which is a type of calcium imaging technique that offers distinct benefits over pre-existing tools in measuring neural activity and is compatible with complex behavioral models in human psychopathology. This was pioneered in 2014 and relies on the use of fiber optics to measure light made from pear thin glass and mirror tubes, which has LED or laser light. Through this technique, it allows for free movement in animals, but that scrambles the image in cells. Fluorescent calcium sensors. These are small cameras placed on the brain surface, which records individual neuronal activity. It helps to understand microcircuitry, but is difficult to conduct in behavioral experiments, since animals need to move freely. Calmodulin is um, a symmetrically shaped hinge protein that binds to calcium ions, and this causes it to fold at the hinges. Through these techniques I mentioned prior, we can then measure the calcium influx, which is where action potentials uh, causes calcium ions to bind to GCAM, making the green fluorescent protein molecules active, and the fiber optic cameras can pick up the excitation. If there are no calcium ions, then that would imply that no light is emitted from the green fluorescent protein, and then if there are, then it is emitted. Reward circuitry. Dopamine is produced by the ventral tegmental area, and it is released into the nucleus accumbens. All drugs affect this pathway, and they influence dopamine, D1, or D2 receptors. Drug exposure and withdrawal also activates D1, but this suppresses the D2. I'll be talking about fiber photometry and its use in behavioral neuroscience. Use of timing. Gunaden, in 2000 2014, found that similar neuro events have different behavioral consequences, such as, for example, social interaction. This researcher used fiber photometry of the ventral tegmental area and nucleus accumbens dopamine pathway to view the interaction with oral in social approach paradigm. Social interaction. The VTA dopamine cells are the most active in mice, and the researchers found that there was a peak and minimal withdrawal. This encodes appetitive approach behavior. You can also see uh, the effects of neurophysiology towards novel objects, whereby the ventral tegmental area dopamine cells were most active during withdrawal from new objects and thereby it encodes for withdrawal. You can't really use a traditional analysis method like CFOS. You can't even use CFOS since it would miss uh, the measuring of this neurophysiological phenomena by half a second. Calipari in 2016 looked at cell type slash pathway specificity whereby the researcher saw how D1 and D2 nucleus accumbens cells induce conditions or behaviors. Cocaine was injected into cocaine pair contexts and that increased activity in the D1 cells but reduced activity in the D2 cells. Mur et al. 2018 predicted later behavior from pre-existing neural signatures. The researchers detect neural vulnerabilities for chronic stress in depression. Mice with fibers observing D1 and D2 were placed into 
the interaction zone and were bullied by larger mice. They were either grouped as resilient, whereby the mice spent more time in these interaction zones, or susceptible, um, where they avoid the interaction zones. It was found that low dopamine, uh, low D1 activity was susceptible to stress, and higher D1 activity was resilient to stress, but D2 was not related. More resilient mice can establish new social interactions compared to uh, those who were susceptible. And I guess that is very interesting that it influences most of the research that I've covered, either from Ganadin, Calipiri, or Mer et al. Activity in the D1 is somewhat important in uh, interacting in new contexts, interacting with new organisms of the same species, but all of these affected less so of the D2 area. Multi-fiber photometry, MFE, records many distant deep brain regions at one time in the same animal. It uses g -chem, optic fibers in the prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, CA1, basolateral, amygdala lateral, or hypothalamus, nucleus accumbens, ventral tegmental area, and bed nucleus of stria terminalis, BNST. Multi-photometry also relies on correlations created by the functional connectivity. So as you can see, multi-fiber photometry measures multiple areas and that it relies on fMRI correlations in order to pinpoint where certain parts of the brain light up and are influenced, let's say by perception and thus influencing behavior. And this allows for deeper analysis of brain structures. Kim 2016 conducted a study in circuitry and system-wide measurement of reward-induced activity using the multi-fiber photometry and it was found that the ventral tegmental area fired intensely to sucrose reward. The VTA dopamine axons to PFC did not fire to the reward, while in the basolateral amygdala, it was slightly activated and the nucleus accumbens fired intensely. Brain regions responded differently to reward, and one needs to see how drugs interact with all other regions as well. So yeah, we covered, in summary, we covered calcium imaging and fiber photometry. We looked at immediate OGs, c -fos, electrophysiology, calcium imaging, fluorescent molecules, fluorescent light, light, fluorescent proteins, red fluorescent, red fluorescent proteins, calcium transits, calcium transients, g and fiber photometry, fluorescent calcium sensors, and modular calcium influx reward circuitries, uh, Finadin's 2014 study in user timing in social interaction and all Cell type and pathway specificity looked at by, was looked at by in 2016. Nerve and 2018 predicting of native behavior from pre-existing neurosignatures, multi-fiber photometry, and Kim 2016 surgery and system-wide engineering of reward use. So yeah, thanks for watching.